I'm almost at the border between Mexico and the USA now, within a stone's throw of the US. The man walking in front of me belongs to the so-called coyotes. You pay them to smuggle you across the border, even across this crazy wall. It's doubly dangerous because the territory is under the control of the cartels at the same time, and smugglers have to pay off each cartel. I really hope we don't bump into any of them now. Dear people, in this episode we will visit the most guarded border in the world, which is nevertheless under the onrush of illegal immigrants. In order to get to the USA, they scale rusty poles, crawl under fire. There are also really desperate guys who hide under the seat covers in buses to travel unnoticed. Others build actual catapults, believe it or not, to shoot cocaine bundles over the neutral zone to the US territory. Here, the night vision camera caught the moment of the shot. Some numbskulls even tried to drive over the wall. Here's a jeep stuck at the top of the steel supports. The guy had to simply drop it and haul ass. How much does it cost? Depends on the place where you want to come across the border. 7,000. 500, 8,000 for a Mexican. I'll show you how people stuck at the border for years live. Look, here are the so-called floodgates that let rainwater accumulated on the other side get into this river. These guys have set homes right under these floodgates. Hey, come on. also go to the really remote areas of Mexico, where people live like in prehistoric times. There's no TV, no cellular connection, no internet except in the mayor's house, but most importantly, there's no police. In the Guerrero State Mountains, people grow heroin, and the towns are ruled by those who drive very expensive cars. We're now riding in the car of a local, you can say, mayor. At the same time, look, he still goes around with a convoy of two cars. Today I'm at one of the most dangerous and interesting borders in the world, the US-Mexico border. Still, despite this huge crazy wall, people manage to leak through the fence. This is Leodov and how people live from the US-Mexico border. Guys, please press like right now. It's very important for the promotion of this video. Hey guys, do you love betters champions, tough bosses and millions of players? Well, the Raid Shadow Legends is a free mobile and PC game is exactly for you and it has all of that. It's got 13 playable factions, but today we're gonna speak about High Elves. Champions in the game are just fantastic and all have history. For example, High Elves are classic good guys, mostly. Their queen is a powerful sorceress and they've been fighting evil since before that was cool. The problem, it's not always clear whose side they're on. To find out more, you'll have to meet them in the story campaign. And for now, we'd like to show you some high elves we like. Look how majestic they look. And that's what I love about the game. Collecting and upgrading champions to make my team stronger. And Raid got its biggest update last month with the Doom Tower. Raid gives away a great champion bulwark to help everyone get started in the tower. Click the link in the description below to get a leg up on the competition with a free void champion, XP booster, 50 gems, energy refills and ancient shard available as soon as you start playing. And don't forget Bulwark, the champion you get for free. You'll find your extra rewards in your box for the next 30 days only. So please go to the description, download Raid Shadow Legends and support my channel. And we are now getting back to Mexico. Do you see this convoy of cars with machine guns? Alongside run policemen and the military, hiding behind the armored doors. This is Culiacan, home and headquarters of the most powerful cartel in Mexico, Sinaloa. The National Guard enters the city to arrest the son of the notorious drug lord El Chapo. After the death of Osama bin Laden, this man became the most dangerous and the most wanted criminal in the world. Forbes estimated his net worth at one billion dollars. Since El Chapo's arrest, his son, known under the nickname El Raton, or the Mouse, is the kingpin of the Sinaloa cartel. So what do you think happens when heavily armed National Guard forces enter the city? Armored trucks with automated riflemen appear out of nowhere. Gunmen block roads with cars and set up roadblocks. Meanwhile, the Mexican security forces manage to arrive to the drug lord's house. Here he is, the one in the cap in a garage full of G-wagons. He gives his cell and gun to a fellow and surrenders. Nobody's hitting him, the guardsmen briefly search him. 
so that he even manages to shoot a message and call to someone. Someone's peacefully patting him on the shoulder. This time, around 700 armed men from the cartel have already taken position all around the city. There are dozens of roadblocks. The moment police try to take El Raton out of the town, a real massacre begins. Cartel gunmen threaten to drown the city in blood, to attack the buildings where guard families reside. After several hours, El Raton is set free. He's not simply released. The president of Mexico records a special address where he fully justifies the National Guard's actions. I support this decision because the situation became very difficult and many people, many people were put in danger. So once again, the security forces tried to capture the kingpin of the drug cartel, but the president says, no, don't do that there will be fewer victims. And surprisingly, he's actually right. Mexico is among the top economies in Latin America. Yet despite that, the number of people who have to flee their homes because of the cartel wars is growing. The majority of cases happen in Guerrero, the hot spot of today's drug wars, since the police can't cope with their duties. There are people who've declared themselves mayors, governors, they basically seized power over huge territory. Leaders or mayors of such town are basically in charge of self-proclaimed armed groups. So everything runs the way they want. We're now going to meet exactly one of such leaders. If all goes fine, he'll bring us inside. These people always appoint a meeting in the same place. In the town where taxi drivers spend the nights in their own cars behind the curtains made of t-shirts or plastic covers, there is only one really decent restaurant. The man greets us with a smile. There are many communities in Guerrero that are managed in the same manner as this one. They have their own police. They don't let the army interfere. These are mainly farmers. They don't earn anything. They only serve the community. It's quite efficient. It's about nine hours by car from the country's capital, Mexico City. The coastline is actually where the territories of such communities with their own police start, because that's exactly where poppy fields are. Once you get there, you're basically in the hands of the local gang leaders. Members of the community will meet us and decide on you. It's the first thing that's gonna happen. It will be a public meeting where they explain how the community is organized. During the whole time of our meeting, the restaurant is guarded by a group of armed and fully equipped military men. Two cars are parked outside by the entrance. As I'd learn later, these are the troops officially registered as police, but de facto working for the man sitting with us at the table. He has bodyguards. He's doing social work. His life is threatened. The man's name is Bruno Placido Valerio. Before riding through the heroin fields with him, I decided to Google his name. I quickly realized that it was a bad idea. Articles in the papers linked him with the local cartel De La Sierra, which grows poppy in the fields we were going to visit. Bruno was also named among those who attacked the rival group that they shot with machine guns and shotguns. Bruno himself denied all that in the interview and called it fake news. He claimed to have no connection with or even mention of the cartel. The sole aim of his community, as he said, is to establish peace and order in town. You know, when I'd realized I'd spend the next two days by the side of this man, I suddenly thought that, damn, of course it's fake news. Deep inside, uh, this guy sure has a heart of gold. We have about 5,000 armed men in the service who protect people in our communities. And this weapon, does it come from the government? No, the uh, community provides money to buy weapons. Today, we have 20 municipalities and around 200 people in each community. What's their occupation? Are they workers or farmers? They are fishermen, teachers, farmers, mainly farmers. I decided to refrain from asking what these farmers grow to afford to arm 5,000 people or more. We were only leaving the town when you can easily tell someone's status just by observing the following. Bruno leaves the restaurant and gets in the car. Meanwhile, a police pickup truck blocks the car traffic from behind. One policeman keeps an eye on the oncoming traffic. Another policeman accompanies Bruno, who peacefully walks, sipping his coffee. The convoy follows us all around town. Moreover, the convoy cars change in each following town we pass. This highway is among the most important ones in the south of Mexico. Most of the cartels fight over this road. 
for you to understand, there were times when lives of whole villages and other settlements along the highway were halted. Children didn't go to school and so on. I'm talking about life totally blocked. Why? Let me explain. The one who controls the highway is the one who brings heroin and other drugs to the Mexican capital. Thing is, the road goes to the port city of Acapulco and also connects Acapulco with Mexico City. So basically, the one who controls the highway is in charge of all drug traffic of southern Mexico. At least 50% of all heroin in the country is believed to travel exactly here. The highway connects the mountainous poppy fields with the biggest cities and allows access to the ports in the Pacific Ocean which in turn opens the routes to Colombia's neighbor, Panama, and to North America, which includes San Francisco, state of California. According to the Inside Crime Investigation, one of the organizations that fights for Highway 95 is the Union of Peoples and Organizations of the State of Guerrero, headed by guess who? The man sitting in the back of our car. It's 7 a.m. in Mexico now. We are now a step away from the US-Mexico border. I'm now walking to a mind-blowing place because I've never seen people live like that in my whole life. There is some sort of canal here, like a huge gutter for the river. In the rainy season, the water reaches the top. When there are no rains, the canal is dry, so the migrants live here. They adjust literally any spot to settle. It can be under a random pole or a piece of concrete sticking out of the wall. They just throw some rugs on the ground, or at times nothing at all, and live here. Looks absolutely crazy. Listen up, some dude's snoring. These guys use curb stones as pillows and cardboard pieces as bedside tables, where some put water for the night. Please note, the shoes are off. Then we can see not just dwellings, but real engineering wonders. That's something literally over the top. Look, they install these structures in the upper part of the tunnel using wheels, car elements, bags, a piece of mattress as supports. Look, there is a man sleeping there. Honestly, you've got to be kind of careful walking around here. Even though it's dry, there's oil dripping from the highway above, so you slowly slip down. Here, one guy assembled some sort of cupboard that hangs a bag with bread, also a blanket. Of course, there are easier ways to create shelter. You can put up a couple of sticks to the wall and simply load whatever you find on top. Yet some guys are really handy. Look how thoughtfully this man has organized everything here. He has the main room or a bedroom with some palm leaves on top and blankets serving as walls. There, as I figured, he has a lounge zone or a living room. Look, there are mops standing there. So he's actually cleaning after himself. See how tidy it looks. He's dug a hole in the ground to make some sort of pit house. There are even stairs. Look, he's got some things here drying on top. Here he has one more zone for barbecue. So he's collected some sticks around and makes himself a barbecue here. This is mind blowing. What an intelligent man, I should say. Here lives Sergio, who is also very polite. First of all, he offers us to have breakfast with him. Do you want a burrito? It's with beans. He didn't simply pile up wooden boards, he dug a hole with a shovel to make something like a pit house. Moreover, note his engineering approach. He also included a special storage niche into the construction plan. Now he has a jerry can with water there. It's not hard to live here, but it's uh, rather tough. When it's raining, water rises. So we come out of here and take cover under the bridge. So water can ruin your house, right? No, it reaches the level, then it's soaked and slowly goes down. I've got to be honest with you, my university dorm room wasn't even that well equipped. He has dish sets, a strainer, a goddamn strainer! I don't even have one in my flat. There is also a pack of eggs, mustard. I spent a couple of months under the bridge, but it was very uncomfortable. So I came here and built a small house. Here I live more comfortably. He lives here since the deportation from the US. All the locals are either those who tried to cross the borders to the USA but were caught, or those who had managed to get there but were later stopped by police officers and had no documents to show. I was deported in 2019, so I've been living here in Tijuana for almost a year, but I don't pay rent. You know what I mean? <laughs> I was caught in Phoenix drinking beer. You mean while driving? No, no. No, no. I was just drinking in the street. They caught me and found out that I didn't have the papers. 
Problem is that the migration services drop people at the border, so many simply don't have cash to pay for a return ticket to get home. People adapt in the best way that they can. I'm looking for a job, but they demand ID. In order to get an ID, I need a birth certificate, which I don't have money to pay for. I'd like to get it, to work, to earn money and to return to my hometown. Sergio has been living in this house for seven months. His neighbor Miguel for a year. As for the guy who plays with coins since the morning, I didn't even believe it at first. I've been living in Tijuana for 19 years and here for 10 years. 10 years? He lives here for 10 years? Really? Mm -hmm. Wow. What's it like to live here 10 years? Easy. Time flies here. These guys have set homes right inside their floodgates. Look, they stole some trolley from the supermarkets. Here they have firewood to cook. Here they have so-called kitchen where they can cook. There they have some sort of shelves. See, there are plates standing there, some boxes, salt. They sleep under this thing. So you climb under it and there they have beds. When the water rises, we just grab everything we have. Sometimes water washes away all our things, mattresses, everything we don't manage to grab. How fast does the water rise? Maybe for an hour, but it can be faster. Say in 15 minutes. There are around 20 floodgates here collecting water and people live under each of them. Each gate has an owner. If you live there, others can't enter. It's prohibited. We have to talk to the stranger first, see if we can allow him to enter. Does he need to bring something for you? No, he just has to behave normally, not steal from us. How do you get your money? We wash cars, windows and so on. The, the line. The line means the borderline. In reality, it's quite dangerous here. There's no way police reach here, and there is nobody who somehow watches over everything. So it's literally their location. Well, when it's not raining. When you come, they feel that you've entered their territory and get mad. Taking the condition of some people here, it's kind of scary. What's the problem? I tell you, okay, no problem. I'm not motherfucker. I want to show how people live. I was kicked out with a camera during the day, and that's what happened when too many migrants gathered here. Tear gas, smoke, grenades, pushing crowds. In 2008, there were thousands of migrants from here all over the continent. At some point, they simply bum-rushed the border. People's rage was only growing as the measures to protect the border toughened. During the election campaign, Donald Trump was repeatedly saying that he'd build a wall between the countries and would make Mexico pay for it. Fun fact, several decades ago, the situation was exactly the opposite. The USA asked the Mexicans to come and work there. During World War II, when the US labor force was at war, the two countries started a joint operation called Braceros. More than 5 million Mexicans were relocated to 24 American states, but mainly to Texas and California. They were paid salary, not less than 30 cents per hour and not more than $3 per day. They had the right to have a house, food, to attend places for the whites. Yet as soon as the Second World War was over and the American men started to come back home, the Mexicans were slowly pushed out. The US government adopted a law imposing penal sanctions for hiding illegal immigrants. In 1954, the wetback operation began. Hundreds of jeeps, buses, seven planes were daily transporting immigrants to deep Mexico so that they couldn't easily come back. Some even had their heads shaved to make it easier to spot repeated offenders. Soon enough, the USA started to strictly control the border, which was, back in the day, simply a line with occasional rock piles turned into a line with a countryside fence first. In 1930, the fence was equipped with barbed wire. In 1947, the fence was already all made of barbed wire. Eventually, the line became the most guarded border in the world. Basically, the border between Mexico and the USA. This is the place of mass migration since the 70s. I mean handfuls, flocks, piles, masses of thousands of people were moving from Mexico to the US. And this is how it looks today. The Mexicans still live right at the border. Look, there are local favelas or barrios that basically lean on the border wall. As for Americans, it's the opposite approach. They build nothing here. This is the so-called safety zone. It is marked by these rusty yet stiff poles. Of course, the wall is not exactly a fully closed wall. First of all, it would be extremely expensive to build it. Secondly, I think the air currents have to go here to enable lasting stability. So the wall consists of the poles with narrow spaces in between. 
You can't squeeze there. There's no space even for an arm. Apart from the poles occasionally blown down by wind, there are also invisible obstacles. Aerostats with cameras powerful enough to see the number of bags someone is carrying. Watchtowers with cameras, including night vision cameras. Moreover, the seismic sensor that can not only detect movements of the trespassers, but even calculate their route. There are also motion detectors. The wall itself stretches even into the ocean. I'd say it looks like rails. The gaps between them are wider, so no one can theoretically hold stomach in and squeeze through. But no way. See? There is wire mesh here, so good luck. When I came to the beach, the police immediately started to shoo me away. I couldn't argue with them, I guess. Eventually, parts of Tijuana by the border turned into small islands of immigrants who have nowhere else to go. Thank God not everyone here lives like that handy dude with a barbecue area. Paolo Vanessa from Honduras, another country for my future trips with a criminal rate like Afghanistan. 20 people are shot there daily. My husband and I decided to immigrate when I was two months pregnant. I was very worried about the whole situation because we also had a two-year-old daughter and no money to feed her. Then we decided to leave. The little baby peacefully sucking her thumb was still in Paolo's belly with umbilical cord around its neck when she left Honduras. Doctors said she'd need a caesarean section or there'd be problems. The water broke at 2.30 a.m. and there was no taxi. I suffered from the pain till 5 a.m. when the taxi finally arrived. But we had to stop because the baby started to come out right in front of my husband and two daughters. I had to take care of the baby myself. I started to bear down and the baby came out. I took immediately started to cry. The taxi driver didn't know what to do, to go further or not. I said it was okay and asked him to cut the umbilical cord. They took care of me. My two daughters said, Mommy, look at the baby, it's a boy. I arrived at the hospital, but when we left, I had nowhere to go and nowhere to live. We didn't know what to do. We couldn't get a place here in the shelter anymore. The girl there said it was prohibited, but it's my baby, my beautiful baby. I'm proud of how I delivered him. It was very difficult to register to him here because I'm from Honduras. They told me I don't need to register the baby. They'll take him away from me. The lawyer came here to the shelter and helped me. They've been living in this tent for six months already. Bags are used as pillows. Kitchen is here too. They were lucky. This shelter usually accommodates people for a couple of weeks only. This family was allowed to stay longer because of the pandemic. It's basically a huge hangar. See, there is barbed wire here. Now look what it is from the inside. You can enter a rather big area with lots of kids running around. Tents are placed one after another. Around 40 people live exactly in this area. There are around 20 tents here, standing in a maximum proximity. Please note that some tents are standing even on top of that structure. This is the so-called bathroom. These two doors are male and female toilets. The male one is a bit busted. Apparently someone kicked it open. Also note that the shower can only be used in given hours. So men have to shower from 8am to 11.30am. It smells good, it's not befouled. Only problem is the curtain here. But here they make some sort of door from plywood. Then there is a shower. Also fairly clean. Water runs here. Only there is not shower head. Only a hole in the wall where the water comes from. But the most important thing here, according to people, is security. They live away from the madhouse behind the wall. What's happening in the streets is a real nightmare. is a woman. She dumped all of her contents of her bag right here on the road. Here is another dude putting trousers up to take them off. It's a real heroin ghetto of Tijuana. Here's a lady with many suitcases and in a good mood. You know why? Because she stole them, kicked out of the house by a scandalous wife. An old man is walking here. It's difficult for him to walk. He's uh, leaning on a mop and a crutch. He's walking and holding this jacket. I didn't really understand at first that he was selling it, but his daughter or someone just came over and asked, like, if you sell it, what are you going to wear? Check out this old guy's fashion. He's wearing a cap and a bandana under it. How much do you want for your jacket? 100 pesos. 100 pesos? It's yours. Why, 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 why do you want to sell it? Why? Because I don't think it's too big for me. Too big for you? Yeah. 
And you need money? Yeah, I need money to eat. I need money to eat. Yeah, to eat? Yeah. Posters with missing people is a normal thing here. This is Eduardo. He lives in another district of Tijuana. His story clearly illustrates the situation here. He has a picture of his son, Lalo, on the chest. He passed two years ago. He was shot by a silly mistake. We were together that day. He said, can you lend me some money? I did. He lived together with his girlfriend. I fell asleep and in 30, 40 minutes, I woke up to gunshots. He was shot four times. Here, here, and here. He was 21. When I reached the place, I saw also my nephew lying there, holding him in his arms. At first I thought it wasn't my son. I said, leave him alone. It's not Lalo. He answered, uncle, it's Lalo. I saw that he was wounded. His jaw was broken. I checked his chin and saw a tear on his face. Paramedics came and took me out of there. My son squeezed my hand. That's how he spent the night. I don't wish this on anyone. My boy was very good and those bullets were not meant for him. They were for his cousin. His cousin was a criminal. But you shouldn't think that everyone here is a criminal or inadequate. While I was strolling around this mess, I suddenly saw a dude fixing a book with a tape. Who gave it to you? Uh, the, uh, the library. Ah, uh, the library? Uh, yeah. You took it from library? Oh, not, oh, the, no, 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 this is uh, sometimes, you know, the library give it to us, uh, donations. You yeah. go to the library to, to read books? Yeah. What is your favorite ones? Oh, uh, like, like, history. History? History, yeah, history, besides history, uh, animals, like, you know, like nature. This is John Gutertes. He's 48. He says he's lived in California since he was eight, until police checked his papers several years ago and deported him from the US. What's your plan? What's your plan? My, well, my plan is just to stay, stay free, uh, stay, uh, you know, stay out of trouble, and just you know, try to he's my uh, my my partner right now, you know. So I'm try to you know like in the future try to you know keep ahead and do do my best and try to get a, a decent job and, and take care of each other. <coughs> I get money, but you know, like working, sometimes I get work, you know, like uh, asking for jobs or, you know, like, you know, like uh, not permanent, but because I don't have a, a credit card right now, a, a ID card. So what I do is go and ask people, you know, uh, like, you know, some businesses, stores or, or just, you know, houses. Many migrants work at the line. They sell hats and snacks. This port of entry is called San Ysidro. It is the biggest and the busiest entry port in the world. Here, between more than 70,000 cars cross the border daily. All in all, more than 100,000 people. It's basically a full-scale town crossing the border to and fro. People working here, you know, washing car windows, offering guns, chips, and all this bullshit have created a whole industry. Some people specifically come here to live in the bushes and work at this border. American border officers check cars extremely attentively here. They open the doors, check if the doors bend, if they are opened and shut the way they should, from the technological point of view. Right now, an American officer is examining this truck with a flashlight. This Jeep, he is opening all the doors, knocking the ceiling to see if there is anything hidden there. Now he's standing like, why doesn't the back door open? Come on, open it now. Now the third person came here. The one on the right is also checking like, what the hell do we have here? There are three of them now examining a single car. Look, he's going under to check under the wheels. He scrutinizes all of the bottom with a mirror on a pole. What if the driver is hiding something in the discs? Look, and he's not lazy to kneel, to go almost underneath the car. Apparently they come across a very suspicious dude and he's not just examining it with a mirror now. He's scrubbing something there with a knife. Like, what if something is taped there? Holy moly, no way you can jip this guy. Now we're in the middle of this autonomous zone in the state of Guerrero. As you can see, there are armed people, not only at the entry posts, but even at the gas stations. There are two people there. They have sawn off shotguns. Ordinary shotguns, it's pretty obvious that it's a kind of trophy weapon or something like that. The man with the shotgun sees the camera and approaches to ask why the hell we're filming there. Then he sees who's driving with and walks away silently. On our way to the autonomous zone, where our friend Bruno is the local king and god, we pass many security checkpoints. Usually it's such guys with guns or rifles collecting coins in the jar and maintaining order at the same time. Sometimes there are guys with police cars, but once they see our companion, they also wave and are friendly to invite us to drive without stopping. 
we insist that we can take care of ourselves. The deeper into the mountains we go, the more people ride donkeys instead of cars. We pass by some strange markets where people sell rocks, some sort of construction market apparently. Many carry building materials on the head. Check out this chick, she has a special pad, together with her hair bun creates a very stable structure. Many locals here don't know how to write and read in Spanish. There are generally many traders here. Salt is sold on an industrial scale. Taco bread is fried everywhere right on the fire. Traders sell a lot of trifle. Look, some beauty with a red bow is waving something bushy to invite a passerby. Local taxi routes look very funny. Back of the car is open, like the trailers used to carry horses or donkeys. There are also kids who pretend to be clearing the road from landslides and ask money for it. When entering Bruno's town, it's called Buena Vista. There is yet another trading spot right on the car hood. Local residents literally run away from the cameras. I don't know where we came in, it's an unfinished house, but this is something like an administrative building here. As soon as we arrived they switched on announcements all over the town, the settlement. Now people are gathering to meet us and decide if they accept us or not. For the gathering, we were invited to have lunch. While we're waiting for lunch, we were served this wonderful thing called chikatana. These are ants running all around with fat asses. It's a local delicacy. They're a bit fried. It's sort of a snack here, like our crackers. Well, uh, can't miss a chance to try this beauty. Hmm, I don't know. It's actually not bad. Dry texture, but it's kind of smoky. Yeah, not bad at all. I'll go after another one. Hmm, they also have this sort of shell, a bit moist. When you eat it, you feel that it's a bit baked. I think if you bake a ladybug, its wings would be similar, kind of wrapped around your teeth. Pretty cool. If you didn't know that it was ants, it would be great with a beer instead of pretzels. Plus, it's healthier, high in protein, no dough involved, so you won't gain weight. Highly recommend. Some even eat chikatana as a side dish. Workers go to town, gathering, wearing or carrying whatever. Here is an old man with a trolley full of wood and pineapple. Another one wears flip-flops and hats. Hats here are kind of ties, like you can simply put one on and be official. Woman in back is breastfeeding. You can't expect her to miss daily feeding because some bloke in the back with a camera. Another kid was playing by mum's side during all the gatherings. By the look of the toys, one can guess the decade this town lives in. A stack of CDs serving as a rattle toy. A toy car, or better, the bottom of a car within two wheels. The kids build garages from some wooden sticks he found nearby. Meanwhile, Bruno and his fellows are presenting their settlement. Buena Vista. Slides are projected to the wall. This projector is probably the only one for 100 kilometers. We have 2,200 inhabitants here. 21% of the population don't know how to read. 9% of the houses have toilets. 22% refrigerators. 0.2% of the population are connected to the internet. Not because people want it that way, there simply is almost no connection here. In order to understand how people live, it's enough to simply visit someone's house. Naked brick walls with clay used instead of solution. Floor is basically absent. Kids are walking barefoot together with huge chikatana ants. 
and other life forms. One room is everything, a kitchen, a bedroom. Look what a neat perch for cups. It's also a storage place. Baby stool is hanging on the ceiling. Speakers from the 90s are standing on one shelf. TV is on top of the garbage bin for some reason. Some sort of housework area is behind the house. Look, there is a bucket where people wash clothes. There is no canalization here, only a barrel with water. There is also a shower here. Let's put it this way. There are also no pipes here, just a hose. Again, no floor, just trampled down earth mixed with stones and pieces of bricks that were lying here years ago. I'm almost whispering because this evening there was a funeral in the house. A 20 year old guy passed away. You know why? Diabetes. Not a mortal disease one could say, but not in Buena Vista. He refused to go to us. He said he prefers to die home than here. People here listen to their relatives, families. Phonies are a big problem here. Before they go to the actual doctor, they go to around 10 other people they know. Witches, magicians, people who have no education. And only after that they go to the hospital. That's why when they arrive, they're already in a bad condition. The doctor himself is not local. He was sent to work here together with a colleague. At the beginning, they were as shocked as I was. What shocked me was this, this attitude to childbirth. Things they do have nothing in common with what we've studied at university. Everyone knows that a woman has to deliver a child in a calm mood, lying in bed with relaxed legs and so on. But here, they deliver babies standing. So a husband is sitting in a chair and his wife is standing above looking at him. They also don't use any drugs. This region, San Luis, has the highest maternal death rate. If you force them as a doctor, they feel interference and resist. Husbands say, if something happens to my wife, I'll kill you. Yesterday I went to see a patient. She had very high blood pressure. She said, no worries, I'll drink water and it'll stop. They don't like to come to the medical center. They also use frankincense. It's like oil or ointment. So they rub it to one side or another. They also massage the belly with a ball or take a towel and slowly stroke the belly from top to bottom. They say it helps the baby move down. This is what they're doing. They also drink hot brew or hot chocolate for the baby to go down, but sometimes when patients have high blood pressure, chocolate only makes it worse, so they start twitching. What if twitching leads to complications? What do they do then? We have a tonometer, a stethoscope here. What if people need the real ambulance? What happens? If it happens, we order a local taxi to get to the hospital. Romero. Here a pregnant woman takes herbs to deliver the baby fast. The blue herb rosemary, or they gather leaves and the birth attendant bathes her in hot water with them. Then they hang her on something like a pull-up bar and tie her hands to it. The birth attendant puts arms around her belly and pushes down to make the baby come out. The best way to get rid of disease is to climb that mountain. There is a special place there. Mayor Bruno takes us there, accompanied by local security. This is a patrol car of the local security in this autonomous zone. What's curious is that the state police don't interfere into the business of this community. These guys all have weapons. Some look like Mosim Nagant. Some are average hunting shotguns, scatter guns. I haven't seen any machine guns. Are they in, are they in good condition? See? Yes. Have you shot from it already? Yep. How many times? Four or five times. For example, there was a murder, a man was killed, but we caught the murderer and circled him. He had no choice. Safety of all towns or settlements fully depends on these local security guys. They have a two-way radio, even uniform, so when people see them, they immediately know that it's the police, the guardsmen. Fun fact, none of the fighters here are actually paid. They're all volunteers. The community chose me and ordered me to serve, so I simply have to. It happens the following way. They place their name on the board and decide whether this man has to serve or not. Each one of us gets uh, to go through that. Is it true that neither you or anyone else in the police uh, or security get paid? Yeah, no money. It's basically social service. How do you earn your living? I have pineapple trees, fields. I also grow uh, coffee beans and so on. I mainly do it on the weekends because all the other days uh, I'm on duty. After we reach the top, Bruno shows the rain altar. This is the place that Mixtex us for healing. Mixtex to people who lived here hundreds of years ago. All those habits like drinking chocolate or hanging on a pull-up bar are left after their ancient dwelling. The most interesting guys were Aztecs, predecessors to the Mexicans. Aztecs were the wildest guys on the whole continent, like the Dothraki in the Game of Thrones. During the first century of their history, they fought so much that they were basically like a living mercenary army. They were paid with food, jewelry, and yes, feathers. Feathers were cool back then. 
Aztecs built their empire similarly to the Tatar Mongolians, but they not only gathered money, they also forced the conquered cities to build roads to each other. It was important because there were neither horses nor transport on wheels, and people moved around by walking. The Aztec Empire came to an end when the Spanish moored on the local shores. By the way, Mexico is the biggest Spanish-speaking country in the world to this day, so the Spanish came to Mexico with a bold dude called Hernán Cortés. Bold because he had no idea about the size of the Aztec Empire, and about thousands of warriors in its army. Cortés himself had around 600 warriors and 16 knights on horses, plus some of them had to share one horse. Cortés didn't ask his government for permission to attack the Aztecs, he simply went for it. Eventually, after three years of fighting and delicate diplomacy, a new country was born. The Kingdom of New Spain. It stretched from the south of America to modern-day Canada. Los Angeles, California, Texas. All of that belonged to Mexico. Such a thing as the United States didn't even exist yet. In 300 years, Mexico became independent and the already formed USA conquered half of its territory, establishing the famous border guarded to this day. We are now going to the city, or better, a small village, that is nowadays the most popular spot for illegal immigrants to cross the border. Point is, in Tijuana, they are now so carefully observing every meter and centimeter of the wall that it's almost impossible to get through, neither at the night nor in bad weather. No way to get through. Yet there is a town only 40 minutes away from Tijuana with an actual mafia of, or corporate network bringing people across the border. We have to meet one man now a guide who knows all the trails and leads people. I thought Coyote Hugo will cover his face, but he says he doesn't plunge into the US territory for more than a kilometre, and the Mexican police don't give a shit about what he's doing, so there's no point in hiding really. The real danger comes from a different type of people. Now they have to pay off the cartels as well, the coyotes. If you don't pay, you won't cross. Point is, tracks the coyotes use to smuggle people, cartels use to smuggle drugs, so they say, pay. We control this territory. That's why we are not raising the prices. Hugo's route from the point of departure to the entrance point on the US territory takes about 40 minutes. It's unbelievably hot here. Like in the desert. The farther you go from the ocean, the more desert it gets. There'll be even less greens. It'll be like that scene from Breaking Bad. Maybe you remember when Walter White's trousers were flying far away? This kind of scenery starts there. The best moment to cross is when it's raining because rain will wash away footsteps in the sand. It confuses migration officers. We reach casino. There is no wall there, only fence. Do you jump over somehow? No, we simply walk. Only thing is, you have to pay attention at the migrant officers. You have to wait for the moment when they don't look. How do you know when the migrant officers aren't watching you? We have observers. The corridor itself is not long. You just run and arrive to the point. Do these observers work for the cartel? No, these are our people. Cartel only allows you to bring your people in together with the, the chicken. That's how we call the migrants. Well, why do you bring people to the casino? Because it's easy. It happens in the night, when there are usually many cars. It's convenient. Casino works 24-7. It's already on the US territory. There we meet another man who brings people to Los Angeles. They pay only when they arrive to the point. Hugo is only an employee of a big organization. How much does it cost? It depends on where you want to cross the border. It's about 7,500, 8,000 for a Mexican. If you're a foreigner, it costs from 12 to 15,000 dollars. Chinese pay 18,000 or even more. Brazilians, also 18,000. Venezuelans, 15,000. Costa Rica, 13. Ecuador, 15. Mexicans get the cheapest. Do you have Russians? Very few, but the price is the same as for foreigners. 20,000. These are uh, expensive people. Hugo gains 2,000 per person. Has it ever happened that you were caught? Yeah. How? It was around the line, because we used, the cross, we used to cross the border differently. People were given fake papers, but the migration officers found out that I was with them. They spotted fake papers and told me that I was their guide. 
Eventually I got one year in prison. So you spent a year in prison? Yeah. Where? Uh, here in San Diego. That's how people live. It's basically a cage, like in a prison for lack of a better word. There is a big hanging lock. Now we'll go inside. This is the place only for men, so it's really tough. It's stinky here, I'll be honest. It smells like old dirty rags. Yet people who own this, so to speak, shelter are doing their best because, see the beds here, are clean. Alexi Yuno Martinez is from Honduras. Back in his homeland, he served for three years in the army. Pero... The constitution of our country forbids the president from re-election. He was supposed to be in charge for four years only, but the president used the military to keep his regime. Eventually, my job became unstable because the criminal rates skyrocketed. Check this out. Even under the Honduras constitution, the president cannot be re-elected like in some other countries. No. There's a criminal gang in our country called Mara. There are also the Metres, 18, Los Cholos. All of those are names of big gangs. If you have business, you have to pay off Mara, 80% of your income. So in the end, it's not profitable. And the moment you say no, they go and kill your family. Alexei eventually tried to escape to the US. I took a bus and rode to the end of the war. There was an easy spot to cross the border. I found a place without the wall, but there were border patrol cars. I waited for the night to cross the hill in the darkness and went for four days. By the end of day four, I ran out of water and food, but I kept going. I was already close, but the motion detector worked. In a second, there were seven 4x4 patrol cars approaching me. I wanted to run, but I couldn't, because when they saw me, they pointed guns at me and threatened that they'd shoot. I had no choice but to stop. Some migration officers spoke English, others spoke Spanish. They asked me where I was from. I told them I was from Honduras. They would ask me over and over, what are you doing in this country? How did you get here? They asked other questions too. I got pissed, so one of them punched me in the belly. I reacted and kicked him. When I kicked him, he wanted to attack me, but other officers were holding him. They told him to walk to the front. They checked my shoes, fingerprints, even took photos of my legs. I spent five hours in a car with air conditioning. I was very cold, but they did nothing only observed. At 2am, they simply threw me out of the car on the grass. What did you do after that? I spent seven more days there. I ate only twice during that week. Before that, when I was there, police searched me. I had around 3,800 Mexican pesos. Cops of the line took the money from my wallet. I had a Mexican residence permit and CUPR, the unique population registry code. They took it away from me and tore it to pieces. Oh, morning in this uh, wonderful town called Buena Vista in the autonomous zone starts at 4 a.m. It goddamn starts at 4 a.m. It starts with a bell ringer tolling the bells. So whether you like it or not, you uh, will wake up. Why so early? Because most of the population here are farmers. So their working day has to finish around 1 p.m. We got some wooden cabin to sleep. Pretty cozy place, I should say. As you can see, there are cracks in the wall to replace air conditioning. It feels like you're sleeping in the middle of a forest, where all living things are working at full volume. Shouting birds, buzzing, cicadas, then something else. The roosters start to shout from 2 a.m. for some reason. When the bell ringer starts a symphony at 4 a.m., there's a choir of roosters already. I think it must be like a cartoon, when they pull their necks and start cuckooing all together. The most interesting plantations are behind these mountains and Mayor Bruno, who repeatedly denied any connection to the heroin fields, brought us to the fields that can be filmed. Surprisingly, we're with the mayor of a small town that's located very deep into the country, yet the wildest animals we saw during the whole ride were some pigs. Still, know how he goes everywhere with a convoy. There are two full cars there with the local security and state police that sometimes does arrive here, but only under very strict supervision from the mayor. They ask him everything, where to go, where not to go, what to do.
И вот здесь, смотрите, просто посреди этих кустов. His task is to cut sugar cane and squeeze it in the machine so that they can take out a juice. After that, the juice is boiled in huge kettles. It looks like a movie. Huge kettles. Looks like they're brewing some potions. In reality, they extract sugar. We boil it for three hours, then we dry it. It turns into real organic sugar without any substitutes produced here in Mexico. It smells like chocolate or candies. It's incredibly tasty. Wow. Mind blowing. No candy could match this. It's the best sweet I've ever tried. It's ideally sweet, but not oversweetened sand. It's something like a mix of, you know, very tender cookie dough, ice cream with like, very thin sugar and candies. Unbelievable. You don't need any tea to rinse it down. You can simply eat it. This is a family business. All the family works here, rests and sleeps as well. Here, near all those fields, basically in the middle of the Mexican jungle, is located a house where these workers live. There are many kids around. I will show you the insides. This room is the main one. Here people can eat together, especially if there are guests. They place a table, cook. Now they're drying clothes here. That's how the second room looks, see? There is only one window here and that's it. A bed and many, many kids. They also dry here clothes. Theoretically, you can live here without visiting the town. All the necessary food is growing all around here. Amazing. This is a grapefruit tree. We climbed after crab apples when we were kids, and here people climb after grapefruits. Here it is, like at the market. I want to try it. How a grapefruit in the wild Mexican mountains tastes. Brilliant, Bram. Man, I want to add some martini to that, you know? It's not the dead ones from the local 7-Eleven, it's the real juicy one that you find at a good market. If you're after martini, you'd have to travel about two hours, or you can enjoy a local party place. Just try and guess what kind of building this is, this kind of shed. Also, please note, when they were building it, there were not enough planks, so some places were covered with small trunks. This is a shop, also a bar, also a nightclub, if the seller's in a good mood and they switch on the music. See, there are fridges inside with coke. By the way, coke here costs less than in Russia, around 50 cents. Next door is total chic. Look, this is a restaurant. Here are the tables. So you come, order something to the owner, or cook whatever you ask. Here is something like a kitchen table. Your order will be cooked. There are pineapples prepared here. By the way, pineapples here are amazing and smell incredible. She cuts them with such a knife. Note how the knife is made. The blade is put into some clay pieces or something like that. I've never seen anything like that before. In the fridge, you can find partially prepared food. So it's not only about cocktails. Look, there's meat, fish, chicken, anything you want. It's pretty cool. You can sit somewhere here, by the way. There's bamboo instead of planks. And there is a VIP zone where I can't enter. Now, in reality, it's the kitchen. They cook everything here. There is a handmade barbecue here. They took a metal barrel, cut it and welded the legs to it. So there you go, a mini kitchen. The only connection here is uh, through speakers installed on the poles. For example, now they announce all who will have birthdays today. Surprisingly, you can buy cards with Wi-Fi in the shop. I was like, Holly Duck? So there would be a cell connection and uh, an internet in town, like in all the civilized world. When I realized it, I started to really watch after the mayor in his office. 
Another thing I simply couldn't figure out was why a small community of 2,000 people is investing into this mega construction project of a huge church. Bruno and his followers were talking about it exactly when a boy at the gathering was riding his toy car into the garage on the dirty floor. It will be part of the church on the very top. It will be the symbol. For you to understand the scale of the project, Bruno hired a professional architect to work in this small village in the middle of nowhere. Under his supervision, they are building a tremendous church. Its height is about 30 meters. The architect's office even developed a whole brand book that illustrates and explains every picture, every figurine and cipher on each wall and column. Moreover, the church is built with so much dedication that the whole region has been living without construction material for months. Thomas is a local carpenter who used to earn money doing furniture and other stuff. See guy. Now because they're building the church, all I can do is use the wood they threw away after they finished their works. Before I sometimes earned 150 pesos a day or $15, well when I had orders. Today I, I don't have anything. Not only wood is scarce now, but also concrete. Look, the stairs simply finish at some point, and then people walk the shabby wooden one. Para que tenga... I want to ask the government to help people like me. For example, to have food. Sometimes I eat my tortillas only with uh, sauce, no meat, no veggies. Just tortilla and some sauce. So now beef, no chicken? No, I, I can't afford meat. So people are not feasting in terms of nutrition. Kids play with empty bottles. There is no internet even though technically it's possible to provide access to the worldwide net. And here is, for instance, the mayor's house, who, by the way, constantly surfing the internet from his mobile phone. A sign of a rich house is a satellite dish. Here we have two of them, which means the house is super rich. Now look at what else we have here. There is some sort of front garden with palms. Here we have a relaxed warthog. Crazy shit. It's not a warthog, but a wild pig, also very rare. It's a super rare animal in uh, Russia. Here it's a common local animal. They keep them, cook, it's a local delicacy. Also there are some ducks strolling around this warthog. Then we have a house. This is the main room where people live. A living room. Here we also have a kitchen with an oven to make tortillas. It's the main dish that they cook 24 seven for breakfast, lunch and dinner. It means three, four times a day. Another sign of it being a rich house is that tortillas here are made with meat. As I discovered later, it's not some beef. It's a super rare animal, armadillo. It's this wonder animal in armor, whose predecessors lived in the times of the dinosaurs 35 million years ago. Well, the dinosaurs died out 66 million years ago, but still. Actually, when I heard the word, I couldn't figure out what it was. I didn't know the word armadillo, and there was no dictionary to use. But I can say it tastes like a posh marbled steak. Top quality and almost without bones. Another interesting detail here is, I don't know what to call it correctly from the medical point of view. It's the bag where the animal's balls are. It's some symbol, very secret. When I asked them, they said, uh, we can't tell you the meaning of this symbology. Here we also have a fridge. Another sign of a rich house is that there is electricity here. Also a luxury for most of the people. When I linked the dots, I figured that Buena Vista is a settlement where all people could live like the mayor. But people have nothing to compare their lives with. Nowhere to read that they can live differently. Nowhere to learn from about reasons to rebel or to complain. And most importantly, no source of education, because there's no internet. Things are the way they are. Curious fact, Bruno's fellows have internet access. So you will have Putin now until uh, 2036. Are you serious? How come you know about that? From the social networks. It's unbelievable that people so far away know about it. After finishing his fishy business, the mayor rides into the town in a huge jeep with convoy and really looks like king and god. It flatters his ego with slight inclination towards dictatorship. Look, I have my own town. If people in the town live differently, there'll be no questions. But using people's weaknesses to cheat them and keep them in the darkness, well, we've seen such cases. Tijuana is a cheap city, especially compared to nearby USA. If a good tourist blogger came here, he'd definitely show you beautiful sceneries, and they are marvelous indeed. He'd show you how to ride this cable shit along the mountains, the central square, Caesar salad that was invented here. I could walk by it, of course. So it's basically long lettuce leaves and a bit of bread. The sauce is tasty, but it's literally lettuce with sauce. I don't know, looks like a ripoff. I want to take a handful of chicken and throw it on top. Well, generally, if you avoid the river canal and don't go around too much, Tijuana is a wonderful place. For example, to have a barbecue with a view of California. Armando does exactly that. He's been living and working in Los Angeles for years. He has American citizenship, but he rents a vacation apartment in Tijuana. I only come on weekends, so it just 
it's easier for me. I'm not dealing with them every day by day basis. I don't do business here. So, you know, the struggles of starting business, I'm not going through all that stuff. For me, it is to come here and relax. Mm -hmm. So I choose a nice apartment. I have a very nice friend and it just a uh, weekend getaway for me. I'm hoping one day soon, yeah, I can stay here. Mexico is a country with amazing landscapes, wonderful food and great people. So if you're thinking of it as a tourist location, don't ever be in doubt. People love and respect their guests here. The next episode is coming really soon from a totally unexpected country. So please subscribe and like the video now. This was Leodov and How People Live.